All right, salamu alaikum. Okay. Okay, bismillah. Sorry, is it possible that everyone could turn their Wi-Fi off? Is that possible? Our Wi-Fi is crashing. Mashallah, I think there's just too many people connecting to it. So if you could just turn Wi-Fi off, just do airplane mode for a second or do Wi-Fi off just to see if that'll help us because we're really trying to stream into that room. And then inshallah, next week, we're going we're gonna to have it in that hall, inshallah, just for uh, comfort and safety, inshallah. If you're able to do that, that'd mean a lot. Let's see if this works then. Okay. All right, we'll get started inshallah. Just cuz I don't want to keep everybody too late. And I'm uh I don't think we're going to be able to go live on Instagram because the network's not strong, but I'm recording it and then we'll upload it inshallah right after. So for those uh if anyone's texting anybody inshallah, we I'm just going to do a live uh, not a live. I'm going to do a recording of it and then we'll upload the recording to the Roots Instagram inshallah right after. So um if anyone's getting messages from somebody inshallah uh, then you know, just let them know that we're we're um, we're just trying to work with the situation as as it's uh, unfolding. Alhamdulillah. Okay, let me um, let me get this book up on here. Inshallah. Is it working? Apple TV? No. There we go. You can see it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, ready? All right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Okay, welcome back. Welcome home, alhamdulillah, to uh, In the Early Hours, where we're going to be, inshallah, reading through um, a book on practical spirituality written by Khurram uh, Murad, who... Uh, Allah Yirhamu, who passed away recently in the last decade, but he was uh, uh, um, you know, a scholar and activist in the UK who wrote this really beautiful book. Um, I recommend buying it, by the way, if you, can, if you can buy it, definitely get your hands on it in the early hours. It helps a lot with um, contextualizing spirituality. A lot of times when we try to find spirituality, we look in all different types of places, and he did a really good job of developing a nice system and a framework that's reliable that people can look to um, you know, to build and to apply in their own life. Everyone here has different circumstances. Everyone here has different r responsibilities and roles. So spirituality can be challenging, right? For the person who, uh, you know, quote unquote, works from home, right? That's, I know you guys took it offensively, right? But for the person who works from their pajamas in bed, right? Versus the person who's working on their feet versus the person who has two kids that they're chasing around all day. Everyone has spiritual needs and for a lot of people, it's just different trying to find that, that satisfaction spiritually. And so he did a really good job with this book. So we're in the chapter now about how to develop what's called i'tisam billah, how to uh, develop an attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this is a command in the Quran that Allah gave us. Wa'tasimu bihablillahi jami'an. Allah ta'ala commanded every person who's a believer that they should hold on tight to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he mentioned uh, uh, in the verse, jami'an specifically, in communion. And to not fracture, to not break apart. Wala tafarraqu. Do not break apart from one another. So this idea of holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that the Quran mentions. And the rope here, uh, you know, we use the rope a lot of times for this idea, this symbol of a lifeline. 
But the scholars of Tafsir, when they unpacked this verse, uh, they understood it to mean specifically the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So holding on to the rope of Allah is a person's adherence, is a person's connection to the Book of Allah and to the example of his Messenger ﷺ. So the first characteristic of i'tisam billah that we covered was the characteristic of gratitude. We talked about the importance of shukr and how at its, at its base, uh, I, have no, I have no question or qualms about saying that faith is ultimately, the bedrock of everyone's faith is gratitude to Allah. The more that a person can be grateful to Allah, the less... Uh, shaky, the less difficult, the less challenging having faith will be. Gratitude is the thing that nurtures your faith. It's the, it's the characteristic that, that instills the strength of faith in the heart of a person. The more grateful I can be to Allah, the more that I can hold on to my relationship with Him. The next characteristic is the characteristic of ibadah, of worshiping Allah. When I say worshiping Allah, what image comes to your mind? Prayer, right? And there's a reason for that. Prayer is one of the, it's, it's the milestone form of worship for many people. The Qur'an talks about the establishment of salah. Salah is no joke, right? The Prophet Sallallahu he ordained the prayer and Allah Ta'ala commanded it to be done five times a day and the Prophet Sallallahu taught us how to perform the prayer as a means of, we can turn one of those back on, at least one, yeah, that's good. Uh, as a means of uh, uh, connection, Right as a means of connection. In fact, if you think about it, the prayer was given to the Prophet وسلم, on the night of Al Isra or Maraj. Right, so the night when the Prophet وسلم, was experiencing his most difficult test, the most difficult moment in his life, in Am al Huzn, the year of grief, Allah called him and brought him to the heavens. And amongst everything that he experienced at the very peak and the pinnacle of this experience, he وسلم, was given the prayer as a gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there's no coincidence here that when the Prophet sallallahu needed to connect to Allah in that, in that difficult time, Allah gave him prayer. So prayer for us remains, and there's, there's a statement that scholars say, as-salatu mi'raj mu'min, that the salah is the ascent, the salah is the ascent of the believer. Whenever a believer needs to leave all of their stresses behind, then they should engage themselves in salah. They should engage themselves in prayer as much as they can. All right, we'll talk a little bit about that inshallah as we move forward. But worship is beyond just the prayer. The prayer is a, is a huge piece of it. It's a keystone. But it's beyond just the prayer. This definition I want you guys to remember forever. Ibn Taymiyyah said that worship, ibadah, is anything that pleases Allah doing that and abstaining from anything that displeases Allah. That's what worship is. So worship could be transformed now from just standing, for example, or just giving charity or fasting. Those are forms of worship that we know. But anything, responding to the phone call of your parents, right, calling them back, texting your friends, dropping off food, picking up garbage, taking, smiling. The Prophet ﷺ said that even smiling in the face of your brother or your sister, not brothers smiling at sisters, right, okay? <laughs> Let's cool it, all right, guys? Relax. Smiling in the face of your brother or sister in Islam with a good intention can be a form of charity, which is a form of worship of Allah. So worship should not be limited. And the reason why I'm spending time on this is because if we talk about ibadah, if we talk about worship, we cannot limit the scope of worship. Otherwise, tonight's talk sounds a little bit too uh, uh, narrow, right? And it sounds impossible. When the, when the author says things like, you need to spend your life in the worship of Allah, you're like, I can't just pray all the time. I have to do more than that. I have to work. But what if earning and working and taking care of your family and being a, a good person, a model Muslim, trying your best, making tawbah, do, what if that was a form of worship? So we'll read inshallah here. He says, out of that sense, coming out of that sense, what sense are we talking about again? What was the first step? Huh? Starts with the G, ends with a ratitude. What was it? Gratitude. Okay, shukr. Coming out of that now, he's continuing. Worship, ibadah, is almost like the, ne the necessary do upon the person once they realize that they need to be grateful. Does that make sense? Everyone has their love language. Everybody has their love language. What's your love language, guys? You guys know what they are? That's a dangerous question to ask unless you know, right? Love languages, right? You guys, there's that famous book. 
acts of service, gifts, physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, okay? So everyone's got what they like. When you do something nice for somebody and they thank you, everybody has the way in which they like to be thanked. Okay, for some of us, it's like brownies, right? If you want to thank me, brownies. For some of us, it's uh, gifts. For some of us, it's coming over and spending time. That's the way that you like to be thanked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love language is worship. His love language is worship. What does Allah love to be thanked by? He loves it when a believer, in a moment of gratitude, when reflecting on everything that they've received, every moment. Remember last time we said that. We are the recipients of gifts that we somehow find ways to complain about. And other people on the same nights that we are complaining are begging Allah, oh Allah, give me that. Right? So once the realization of how lucky we are sets in, then Shaykh Khurram says, the next step is that the believer needs to say, it's time for me to worship Allah. I can't. I can't be ungrateful. I can't be a person that gets everything and says no. I'm not going to thank. Because naturally, what happens? What happens to the relationship? Let's go down to the human level. What happens to the relationship of two people? One person constantly giving and the other person never thanking. What happens eventually? It burns out, right? The person that gives eventually, and Allah is not like people. But if we think about it from an etiquette standpoint, Allah gives, and the only condition that he put in order for the person who receives to keep receiving is that they be grateful. And his language of gratitude is worship. So worshiping Allah is the way in which we understand how to thank him for these blessings. If Allah gave me something, then me waking up to pray Fajr is not an ask. It's not a big ask, right? It's not too difficult. Why? Because when I go to sleep at night, I expect to wake up tomorrow. I expect to wake up tomorrow. And no one's going to sleep tonight not expecting to wake up tomorrow. Right? Yes or no? Everyone is hoping, and, and, and you should, and you should. We have optimism with Allah. But then how can we expect to wake up healthy and happy with our jobs and our livelihoods and our friends and our family? How can we expect that and not at least get up to worship Allah with what he asked two rak'ah before the sun comes up? It doesn't make sense. And I tell this story a lot, but my mom, she wanted to do that. She wanted to impress this upon me in a way that I would never forget. And so any time that I would not pray Fajr in the masjid, okay, like I would pray it at home. Anytime, we live very close to the masjid, so the expectation was you got to go. So anytime that I wouldn't go, because it's Chicago, and it's like 21 degrees outside, and it's like, and I just wouldn't go, she would, while I went back to sleep, call my job, and she would call in sick for me. And she would say, yeah, Abdurrahman's not feeling well. He can't come in. And they're like, who is this? And she's like, thanks, bye. Right? Like, dude, just <laughs> <laughs> she would hang up. I would wake up to get ready to go to work, and as I'm getting ready, She'd be like sitting there like an like a evil genius, you know, like cat on her lap, chair turned slowly. Where do you think you're going? I go, I'm going to work. Mom, you know I'm working. She goes, no, you're not. I said, why? She goes, you didn't get up and pray. I said, I prayed, Mom. She goes, no, you didn't pray in the masjid. And I said, Mom, look, I was tired, blah, 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 blah. And usually it's all just excuses. I was up late the night before for no good reason, whatever. She would say, how do you expect to take from the risk of Allah and you can't do one thing for him in the morning? How would you expect that? And guys, you think this happened once? My mother's Egyptian, guys. <laughs> once a week is more like it. This happened a lot. This is, and again, this is her, her logic. Now, some of you might be like, that's too tough, right? That's a little bit too difficult. Okay, I understand. Generational difference. But hear me out. There was never a time in my life where I ever, after those moments, thought to myself that I deserve something without at least attempting and trying my best to pray Fajr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the days where you miss it, the days where you sleep in because they happen, it's not casual, right? You're not like, oh, it's okay, right? We lost this game. We'll see him next time. No. There's a sense of guilt and remorse. The tawbah that's necessary to be, re re to be forgiven for that it requires remorse. That's why when the person misses a salah, what should they do? When you wake up and you miss fajr, what do you do? Immediately get up and make wudu and pray. And the Prophet ﷺ says for that for the person that normally makes their prayer and that they're not able to, and then they get up and they do it, he ﷺ says that Allah Ta'ala, out of his generosity for that person, will count it as if they never missed it. 
because they made it something that was normal for them, okay? So worship, again, is one of those things that you have to connect to gratitude. If you don't connect worship to gratitude, worship will always be a burden. It will always be a burden. If you don't connect worship to gratitude, it will always seem like you're doing it for no reason. But the moment you connect worship to every blessing you have in your life, ongoing, never ending, then the worship goes from being a burden to being a blessing, an opportunity. I get the chance to thank Allah. I get the chance to thank Allah for that thing that he did for me. So he says, out of the sense of receiving everything from Allah comes another important character trait for those who hold on to God, and that is exclusive worship of Allah. The Quran states that true taqwa cannot be attained until all your actions in life are done for the purpose of pleasing Allah. In the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nas, a'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tatakum. Allah, in, in the initial stage of Surah Al-Baqarah, very first, I mean 21, right? So that's like maybe two pages in to on the second or third page. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, this is the first command to all of humanity. If you look in the Quran from start to finish, this is the first command. Ya ayyuhal nas, O humanity, i'budu rabbakum. Worship your Lord, your carer, your sustainer, the one who takes care of you. Rab, that word Rab doesn't just mean God. It means the one who makes sure that you have everything. The one who takes care of you. Worship that one, the one who created you and the one who created those before you so that you could attain taqwa, this awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must ensure that your heart, your qalb, submits totally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is hard. He's writing this as if it's very easy, but it's difficult. We struggle every day with dedicating our heart loyally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're constantly fighting that battle. That's something that we have to go through every single day. But the good news is, if a person engages in this battle frequently, Allah ta'ala makes it easier for them. Aren't there things that you did before in your life that were displeasing to Allah? Don't share. If people start raising their hands. I haven't even finished yet, right? Yeah, I'd like to share. Uh, no. There are things that you and I have done before in our life that were displeasing to Allah, and there comes a time or a moment, it might be Ramadan, it might be where you look back and you are actually like displeased that you actually ever found pleasure in that. And you're like, I wish, it's actually one of the most regretful, remorseful moments is like when I think about the things that I used to do. I wish that I never did that. And it doesn't have to be like the most evil, horrific thing, but there's just things, right? The way that you talk, the way that you, you're like, I wish I never did that. When you go through those moments of reflecting about how Allah brought you from there to here, you realize that you're increasing in loyalty. You know what loyalty can look like? Loyalty can look like telling the truth in a moment that you normally lied. In that one moment. Loyalty can look, like honestly, I'm being real. Loyalty can look like when a person decides to pray when they normally would have just skipped it. That's loyalty. When you make the right decision in a moment when you normally would have made the wrong decision, that's a sign that Allah is bringing you close to him, that he's bringing you closer and closer. This just happened to me the other day, subhanAllah, man. I, <laughs> I was driving home. You know the battle for dhuhr is always so difficult because dhuhr comes in, you're like, I should pray, and then something happens, right? And then you're like, let me go out. Dhuhr's long. I got a few hours. I'll pray later. And then you start doing stuff, and then before you know it, Asr is sneaking up on you, and you look at the clock, and most people start to search online fatwa for skipping prayer. Oh, there's a hadith where if it rains, I can combine, right? You, feel, you stick your hand out the window, you're like, maybe a little humidity, right? And you try to find any which way out of that moment. Instead of just doing the right thing, which is the tough thing, but doing the right thing, which is instead of heading to your next destination or heading home, and you know that you're not going to make it in time, you look up a masjid, you look up a place, or you just do it like the OG style, you just pull up to a QT, Right? <laughs> and and, and you, you pull up to a QT, you put out your prayer rug, and you pray, subhanAllah. And you make wudu with whatever bottle of water you got, right? We have a million excuses to why we don't pray. But there's a billion reasons why we should. On top of every, for every excuse, there's a billion reasons why we should. When we make those decisions in moments that we normally wouldn't have, you need to smile and say, alhamdulillah, that my loyalty is being rewarded and Allah is bringing me closer to him. Your heart is being brought closer to Allah. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, enter into Islam wholeheartedly without reservation. 
Let's go here. Your qalb cannot be compartmentalized. Your heart cannot be compartmentalized. What does he mean by this? Your relationship with Allah cannot be split up. Imagine somebody getting married, and like on the wedding day, they're like, I still love someone else too. <laughs> now, we laugh, and some people got really upset. That, that distaste, that, that, that nausea you felt, that moment, we do that with Allah every day. We stand before Allah in Salah, and we're thinking about something else. Right? Allah asks us not to do a very small amount of things. And we treat every prohibition as if it's like everything in life. My friend with Hot Cheetos, man, back in 2008. <laughs> do you guys remember when Hot Cheetos were haram? <laughs> For like 98 days? <laughs> and then thank God that like Sheikh Yasser Khadi is also a chemist. <laughs> and he figured out that we could eat it. Honestly. You deny the gifts of Allah, man. Allah takes away hot Cheetos for three months. You lose your mind. And then Sheikh Yasser Qadi comes in and saves the day. The chemist scholar, right? MashaAllah. No, but listen, seriously. I'll never forget walking into a gas station with my friend, who now is a scholar, by the way. He's a sheikh, which is really funny. And he picked up a bag of hot Cheetos, and he hadn't gotten the news yet. And so another one of my friends is like, yo, put that back. And he's like, Why? Is there a bigger bag of hot Cheetos? <laughs> <laughs> and the friend goes, no, man. They have this like rennet in them that's from this and this cow and the cow is Jewish or it's not Muslim or something. It's not like, <laughs> you can't eat it. And my friend, I'm telling you this, it must have been a long day. He took the bag and he like threw it at the floor and he goes, man, everything's haram. <laughs> like you take this from me now. You know, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do this. And I think it was like on prom and we were like not going, right, to be good Muslims. I was like, I'm skipping prom and I can't even have hot Cheetos. So sometimes in life, we are, we are raised up in a way that makes us think that the haram outweighs the halal. But halal, there are scholars that have written, scholars of law that have written books about how the halal outweighs the haram by like, it's like 99.9%. .9%. Allah's prohibitions are so minimal, so minimal on the believers, but the nafs, the ego, it takes those prohibitions and it magnifies them and it makes them the biggest deals. This is what he means by compartmentalized. Not that you have to be perfect, because no one's perfect, but at the very minimum, your heart should not split its love between Allah and anybody else. Your heart should not split its love between Allah and anybody else. You know, Ibn Atta'illah, he wrote this line that I think is so profound. When he talked about the rituals, five daily prayers, Ramadan once a year, Hajj, Zakat, etc. Some people ask, like, why is Islam so full of rituals? Why are there practices that have to be done every day? Why are there prohibitions, etc.? And he wrote this line that I love. He said that Allah ordained Islam like this so that your heart doesn't fall in love with anybody else because Allah Ta'ala would hate that you lose out on loving him when he's the one who gave you everything for someone that didn't give you everything. Like you dedicate your love to someone that didn't give you everything over Allah who gave you everything. I make an appointment to hang out or to go out with certain people and I skip my salah, assuming that when I get there, my body's gonna be working just fine. My car is not gonna get a flat tire and I'm forgetting that what was required upon me in that moment was to show my loyalty to Allah, not to my friends in that moment, okay? So compartmentalization is something that the heart should not do. The Quran talks about this. The Quran speaks about this. When a person enters into Islam, emotionally, from a standpoint of faith, they have given everything they have to the faith. Doesn't mean they're perfect, but what it means is from a standpoint of emotional connection, they are all in. They're bought in. When somebody gets married, it doesn't mean that they're perfect. A lot of people that are married are not perfect. They're working on themselves every day. A lot of you married people are nodding. Stop. <laughs> I don't need to know about your spouses like that, okay? <laughs> right? When you get married, you're not declaring your perfection, but you're declaring your loyalty. You're saying that as imperfect as I am, I'm going to work on getting better. I'm going to become the best version of myself. When you dedicate yourself to Allah, you're not telling Allah you're perfect, but you're saying, oh Allah, your mercy 
outweighs all of my flaws. And I'm dedicating myself to you, O oh Allah, as a person, as an imperfect person, because you have given me everything, and I know that your mercy outweighs any of my misdeeds. So this compartmentalization has to be done away with. You cannot dedicate one piece of it to Allah and another piece to some other god, like wealth or status or career. Notice, by the way, how he defines God. When we think of God, when there's like, oh, they worshipped other idols, we all think of the same thing, that horse outside of P.F. Chang's. Exactly. When you go into P.F. Chang's, you're like, I don't know if this is shirk or not. Like, <laughs> can I eat here? <laughs> like, this is a giant horse, you know? Everyone thinks of idolatry as being idolatry to a statue, to a physical thing. But subhanAllah, man, we, we are vulnerable to committing idolatry with many different things that are not statues. The idols of our era are not made of stone. The idols of our era are things that we choose over Allah day in and day out. May Allah protect us from that. He says, there is a beautiful verse in the Quran which throws light on the absurdity of such a situation. It tells us about some of the mushrikeen or the idol worshippers who sacrifice animals and then they dedicate one part of it for Allah and another is for their idols. Like, okay, the ribeye is for Allah and the brisket is for hubal, right? Like they, they cut up the animal in different ways. The verse then states quite clearly that whatever is assigned to Allah and also is in reality assigned to the idols. For Allah does not accept something divided between him and others. Just like Allah does not share the responsibility of taking care of us with others. That makes sense? Since Allah provides for us alone, independently, then it doesn't make sense for us to dedicate our loyalty to anything else besides the one who takes care of us alone. He is one, indivisible, and wants human beings to be undivided in their service to him. So long as our heart lies in a hundred places, so long as our eyes are set in 100 directions. Do you know what's so interesting? In the salah, one of the things that breaks the prayer is when you look to the left or right. Do you guys know that? If a person turns their shoulders, not the eyes, it's, the eyes are definitely uh, uh, makru, but when a person turns their, their you, know, you know, there's a really bad story that I'll tell you that's really funny to show you how this works, okay? When you go to Mecca or Medina and it's very crowded, people will start to pray in all kinds of places that they're not supposed to pray in. Just to get into the masjid, they'll start praying. So they're walking in, they're walking in, and there's a hallway, and they're like, and they join lines that you never thought were joinable. And they jump in, and the security guards are like, you know, trying to preserve some kind of fire exit, some kind of hallway. In order to break their prayer, these security guards walk up to people, and they just take their shoulders and turn them to the left. <laughs> It's like a game of dominoes. They just walk up. And it's funny because the people who are praying know that they're not actually, they start and then they're like hiding, right, in salah. But this person comes. That's how it works. When a person's shoulders, when they're, when they're no longer facing the qibla, it, their prayer is now broken, right? Now, physically, we might have too much shame or we might have too much shyness to, to do this in public. But internally, is our heart not looking all over the place during salah? Like, should we not feel at least a little bit shy? Maybe our prayer is still on paper. We get that check mark. But if we were to grade it based off the substance of the salah, is it as good as the physical representation? Or are we thinking about a million things? You want to know how this works? How many of you have ever forgot which rakah you're on? Don't raise your hand. It ha how many of you have forgotten that you didn't make wudu until you were in the fourth rakah? You did an entire wudu'less salah, which is not salah. At that point, it's just yoga. Like, it doesn't actually, it wasn't prayer, right? Part of, Imam Ghazali says this. Are you ready for this? Imam Ghazali says, your concentration in prayer begins before the prayer starts. Your concentration in prayer begins before the prayer starts. How is your wudu? How is your approach to the salah? Imam al-Ghazali said that if a person wants to take their salah seriously, they need, to, uh, they need to approach it seriously. They need to put, one person taught me, put perfume on your prayer rug. One person taught me, another uh, person that I know, uh, uh, he, he has a special place in his house, this area where they pray salah. Not like a, a big place, it's a corner. But it's, it's designed in such a way where distractions are limited, they're reduced to the most minimal. 
Why is this stuff so beautiful? Because it shows, again, that loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, th- when something matters to us, we take it seriously. We take our Zoom calls with work more seriously than we do with our prayers. We don't want to be embarrassed about where we are when it comes to talking to our coworkers and colleagues and managers about our projects. But when it comes to salah, what we wear, our posture, our focus, our concentration, it's almost absent. May Allah forgive us. These are all signs. These are all signs. So he says, our eyes are set in a hundred directions. So long as we have so many loyalties, we shall never be able to achieve the condition of holding on to Allah. Why should we allow divided loyalties to capture parts of our hearts? Nothing in this world is going to be of use to us when our, we breathe our last. Nothing in this world. When, our, when, when we are on the moments of death, when our life is ending, nothing that we dedicated our heart to is going to come back to us and help us except for Allah. That's it. Imam Ghazali includes that one story in Ayyuh al-Walad, the story of Hatim al-Asan. When he says that, I looked around me and I noticed that everybody spent all their time trying to gather friends and trying to gather followers and trying to gather money and things. And he said, I noticed that everybody spent all their time trying to gather these things. And then he said, when I showed up to that person's janazah, not a single person that they thought was their friend was there. When I went to go wash their body, none of their friends were there washing their body. No one was there. And we lowered them into the grave. Only three or four of us could do it. And we left them. He said, all that time dedicated to chasing everything. I read something that blew me away. They said, that job that you give your life for, before your body's in the ground, they've already posted a new hiring when you're done. It's scary. The job that we skip Salah for, already posted a new position open before your body's in the earth. They move that quick. But we're so convinced. We're so set on the fact that this accomplishment, climbing this ladder, doing this, doing this, that's what's going to give me happiness. No. Whenever we find a void in our happiness, we will also find a void in our worship. That's the way it is. Is the microwave done? No, it's beeping. Okay. However hard we may have striven for it and however valuable it may seem to us, we must recognize that the prizes that we seek are not the worldly possessions received from human beings like ourselves. Uh Uh-oh. I'm just happy it stayed on this screen. Could not connect. Uh Uh-oh. The Wi-Fi, mashallah, is like broke the Wi-Fi here. Back on? Ewa. Ewa kidda. All right. We must recognize that the prizes we seek are not worldly possessions from people like ourselves. It is only our creator who can put real value on our striving. Okay? Let's go to this sincerity and worship. What does it mean to do everything for the sake of Allah? And how can that be a crux of our lives? People are in the habit of classifying life's activities into those which are mundane or religious. We always do this, right? Deen or dunya, deen or dunya. When a person reaches a point of ikhlas and sincerity, what they realize is that everything becomes for their deen. There is no such thing as deen or dunya. Every single thing becomes part of their deen. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, one time there was a companion that was made fun of by a non-Muslim in his time. And they were made fun of on the account of that the Prophet ﷺ taught the believers how to clean themselves after using the bathroom. Right? Sounds like an after school special now on Netflix about this Muslim kid. Hey, Abdul, right? You know, like getting made fun of for why? Because they clean themselves. Low key, this happened to me, by the way, after practice one day in high school. I was taking a water bottle into the stall, and they were like, Are you thirsty? And I was like, No. <laughs> and I was like, No, I'm just, I was like, I'm not going to do the math for you, but like, it's fairly obvious. And they were like, You wash yourself with water? And I was like, Yeah, they're like, Gross. And I was like, Is this opposite day? Like, (laughs) are you responding in a way that I'm supposed to respond? It was so interesting. I didn't do the the peanut butter. Anyway, so (laughs) I know people do that to try to show. And now look, subhanAllah, man. I was in high school. That was back in the early 2000s. Now 
Like you got dude wipes. You got all these mark- products out there that are in line with the Sunnah of the Prophet so something about cleaning oneself. I know you guys are laughing, but say alhamdulillah that you're Muslim, dude. This is something that's crazy. You go to a Muslim country, you don't even got to worry about bringing a bottle with you. All the bathrooms are hooked up, mashallah. So the Prophet وسلم, one time his companion was mocked and ridiculed. The person said, your messenger teaches you everything, even how to clean yourself. And the companion took that and said, yes, yes, everything. So if, if, if a person can maintain their hygiene for the sake of Allah, then you can go to work for the sake of Allah. Then you can do everything for the sake of Allah. It just takes a special skill. You want to know what that skill is? How well can you connect where you are back to your provider? How well can you do that? It, it's, it's, like, it's like solving a puzzle. How is where I am right now ultimately from my Lord? Could be a restaurant. That one's easy, right? Because food, alhamdulillah, ladhi at'amana wa saqana wa ja'allana mila muslimin. I love that dua. All praise be to the one who gave us food and drink and made us Muslims. That make us Muslims part is one of my favorite parts. You know why? Because the dua is including that. Because a Muslim understands that this food and drink didn't come from the farm. This food and drink didn't even come from the earth. Ultimately, it came from Allah. The Muslim side of a person's existence shows them where everything they enjoy comes from. Every single thing. So the puzzle you have to solve when it comes to sincerity is in this moment. How did Allah bring me to this place? How do we, you know, mashallah, recently we had all the residents who matched, people getting new jobs, houses closing, right? Why do you think one of the first things that Muslims try to do when they buy a house, you guys ever been invited to one of these? What do they do? What? They read Quran, right? Now, sometimes the way it's done can be a little sus, all right? Okay. We got to read Quran while making tawaf. It's like, no, there's only one house we make tawaf around of, right? And that's in Mecca. But okay, the idea is still beautiful in that what? We have been given this now by Allah. And the first thing that I want to do in this home that was given to me by Allah is I want to recite the book of Allah. If you can't see how beautiful that is, subhanAllah. You know, there's a dua for even buying new clothes. There should be a chrome extension. Every time you hit checkout, that dua pops up. You got Mashadi Afasi. Allahumma. Like, you, like that's how it should be. Because, you know, there's a small book. Everyone, you can download this on your phone. Hisnul Muslim. It's called The Fortress of the Believer. In the book, if you look at the table of contents, the table of contents is filled with scenarios. It's not a normal table of contents. It doesn't have subjects. There's scenarios. Literally, it reads like this. Waking up. Brushing your teeth. Entering the bathroom, leaving the bathroom, eating food, and then it gives you page numbers. You know what's on those page numbers? The dua that you should read in accordance to the action that you just did. For every action that we do, there is some sort of dua that we make. It's a sincerity hack. There's no way that a person can be insincere when every action they do is tied back to their Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is done for other, uh, uh, he says that, for the sake of Allah are all the religious things. Then everything that's for other than Allah, however religious they may seem, is a worldly act. If a person prays ostentatiously, okay, let me explain this for a second. This is an easy solution for sincerity, but there's a little bit of a challenge here now. The challenge with sincerity is when a person starts to do things that should be for Allah, but they do them for the sake of other people. And and, and if I'm going to be really honest with you, I feel like in a way, sometimes the way in which we are brought up as Muslims, we are conditioned to do this. If you were ever brought up and asked about your salah in an attempt to teach you how to pray, and then you were punished because you didn't or there was something, or you were forced to do good deeds in the vision of other people, like parents or grandparents, in some way, shape, or form, you've been the opportunity for sincerity was made more difficult. One of the ways that we learn sincerity is by doing things when no one is around. Doing things when no one is around. The Prophet ﷺ, he taught us this. He said that showing off your good deeds is more difficult to find than a dark ant on a dark rock in the middle of the night. But what's the danger here? Everything that we do 
if we do it for a reason that's not for Allah, on the day of judgment, you will show up expecting to see everything. How many fasts have we done? How many years of fasting? How many tarawih prayers? How many lectures? How many moments have we sat in? And on the day of judgment, that mountain of good deeds will appear in front of you and you'll become excited. And then all of a sudden, moments notice, a wind comes and blows all of it like dust. And the person becomes frightened. Ya Allah, what happened? What? Where do my good deeds go? And the angels proclaim and say, this is because you were one way in public and another way in private. You were two different people. When you were in front of people, your tajweed was, mashallah. When you were in front of people, when you had to lead prayer, suddenly you knew more surahs than surah al-ikhlas. But every prayer you made at home by yourself was nothing than what? Inna atayna kil kawfaf. Allah. I don't even finish it. Every prayer in the, in the solitude of my own home when no one's around me is the shortest prayer possible as if I don't want to spend time with Allah. We only make things short when we want to get out. Can you imagine how that makes Allah feel? That every time his servant comes after receiving endless blessings and maybe only getting a couple prayers a day that when the servant finally makes it to the prayer rug, the only chapters they read are the shortest things that they can come up with? If you type in on Google, what's the shortest amount of Quran, it'll finish that I can read for my prayer to still count. Imagine having friends or family that you say, I can't talk, for you. I can't talk to you longer than 30 seconds. What love, what lack of love would they feel in that? So here, he's teaching us about the importance of making our love for Allah sincere. And part of how we can do that is by outperforming our public deeds in private. Outperform who you are in public in private. If you pray all the time with people, like tarawih prayer, then do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Go home, and before you dive into your bed and go to sleep, pray to raka'ah by yourself at home. Just to see how sincerity feels just to see how it feels when no one's around you, when you don't have to be on autopilot, when you're standing there next to everybody else who's motivated. There's benefit to doing it with people, but doing it by yourself, there's a sweetness there that you'll never find. So he says, remember though, only those things done for the sake of Allah are the religious things. Everything done for other than Allah, however religious they may seem, is a worldly act. Ibn Atta'illah says, how many deeds do we do that are painted with the image of deeds of akhirah, but they're actually deeds of this dunya. And how many deeds do we do that are painted with the actions of this life, but they're actually the deeds for the akhirah? We could be doing things that look like normal deeds. Eating, drinking, going to sleep, holding the door open for somebody. Just looks like a normal deed. But with the right intention, Allah Ta'ala counts that. I'll share with you one story that I think is amazing. Imam Ghazali, he narrates a story, and he says that there was once a wealthy man who was extremely wealthy, and he used to give loans to people. They'd come to him, ask for a loan, he'd give it. One day he woke up and he decided that he wanted to, on that day for some reason, forgive all of the debt that people had with him. So people had money that they borrowed, they were in debt. He woke up and said, you know what, today I have enough money, I'm going to forgive all this debt. So he told one of his workers, go and announce to everybody that has a, a loan with me that I forgive them. They don't owe me any money anymore. He did that, people were happy. Alhamdulillah, he lived the rest of his life and he died. Imam Ghazali says in this narration that this person, when they're brought back to life, they will have a conversation with Allah. We're told about this conversation. And the conversation with Allah goes that Allah will ask this individual that you forgave all of these people's debt. Why did you do that? And in the narration, it actually says that this person rarely prayed and they barely finish their fast. They weren't a spectacular Muslim. Sometimes you hear of deeds like that and you're like, oh, they must be like an incredible Muslim. This person was like barely hanging on to their Islam. But they woke up and they said, I want to forgive debt, right? And they didn't even say for the sake of Allah, just wanted to be a nice person. Maybe it could have been seen as he wanted to become famous. He wanted to become a legend before he died, the most generous person. So Allah asked him, why did you do that? And he said, oh Allah, I don't have much from prayer or fasting. I don't have much. But what I could do is I could forgive these people from the money that they owed me. And I did it for your sake. There was no benefit for me to do it, Ya Allah. I did it only for you. 
And Allah Ta'ala says back to that person, you forgave all of them? And the person says, yes, Ya Allah, everyone who owed me a dime, I forgave them. Allah says, you forgave them, but no one's better at forgiving than me. And so let it be known that I have forgiven you. Everything that they missed, every flaw, was outweighed by one moment of sincerity. Do you see how important this is? It's that one moment where your entire being, all of your desires, all of your rationale, all of your logic is saying, do this, but your heart is louder than all of that. And your heart says, no, do it this way. Make this decision. Your nafs is screaming at you to do something, and your heart is saying, no. I know that this is what my Lord wants from me. And you don't let anything else tell you otherwise. No person, whether it's you or anyone else, can change that mind. There's a, pro- a person that came to the Prophet ﷺ. says, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Sa'ah. Oh, oh, Messenger of Allah, when is the hour? Can you imagine a person? Okay, I want you to, I want you to imagine the kind of person that goes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, when is the day of judgment? It's kind of like the person in class who's like, is this going to be on the test? Do you, you guys catch my drift here? The person who's asking the prophet, when is the day of judgment, is definitely that guy who is like, when is the exam? So I can show up to class and take it, right? You guys, you guys feel me? Okay. So the prophet, sallam, in his response, doesn't give this person a date or time. He doesn't say it's going to be on this day and this time. He says, ma adatta laha. He says, what have you prepared for it? What have you done for it? Don't worry about when it's going to be. Worry about what you've done for it. And the man gives the most gut-wrenching answer I've ever heard in my life. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I haven't prepared much. If I'm going to be honest with you, you know, if, if we put it in our terms, Ya Rasulullah, I failed. I haven't done much. But he says, Ya Rasulullah, one thing that I can tell you, even though I didn't pray and I didn't do all of my obligations as well as I could have, didn't wear the hijab, didn't do this, didn't do that. Ya Rasulullah, I struggled. But one thing I know for sure is that I loved Allah and I love you. I love Allah and I love you. The Prophet Sallallahu smiled and he said, Al-mar'u ma man ahab an yawm al-qiyamah. A person will be with who they love on the Day of Judgment. All of this man's neglect completely outweighed by one moment of sincerity of love for God and his messenger. Do you see how powerful sincerity is? And do you see how dangerous it is to go through life robotically not feeling and searching for that moment of sincerity? Why am I going over this now? Because Ramadan is the month of sincerity. Everyone in here who does Ramadan as much as you can, everyone in here who does Ramadan you are experiencing sincerity, and you may not even realize it, but you are. For every person that's fasting, you can break your fast. That's not a fatwa. <laughs> you are capable of breaking your fast, not you can, okay? You absolutely, if a person wanted to, they, they could absolutely break their fast. Not a fatwa again. But they don't. Why? Not even water? Yes, Kevin, not even water. <laughs> you know? I was at the gym today, and I was doing my, my physical therapy, and the person was like, you sure you can't have water? I was like, man, I thought Shaitan was locked up, man. How did he get a hold of you? This guy keeps telling me, you sure you can't have water? Right? So subhanAllah, once, I'm sorry if your name's Kevin, by the way. My dad's name is Jim, all right? I don't have anything against Caucasian names. So, but let me finish with this. Let me finish with this. In Ramadan, you experience moments of sincerity that you normally never experience. Don't let this month go by without you capturing these moments. Don't let this month go by without you capturing these moments. It is the Prophet Sallallahu when he was ascending the member, he was heard to have said, Ameen. Ameen, Ameen. He said it three times. The companions asked the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, what was that? We've never heard you do that before. Say Amin, but we didn't hear any du'as. He said, Jibreel came to me. And Jibreel made a du'a that was inaudible to you, but I heard it. And when I heard it, I said Amin. 
And one of those du'as that he made was, may, basically the way to translate this is, may the person be destroyed. Who, Ramadan came to them, and they did not seize the forgiveness within it, and it left them, and they were not forgiven. Why is he saying amin to that du'a? It's a harsh du'a. He's saying amin because it is so easy for anyone to be forgiven in Ramadan because sincerity is right within your grasp. We ask Allah Ta'ala to keep us sincere. We'll finish, inshallah, with this. And that's why he finishes. Many people fast but gain nothing from their fast except for hunger and thirst. Many people pray all night but gain nothing from their night prayers except sleeplessness. Don't let Ramadan be a month of no gains, brothers. And I'm not talking about the gym. Make sure that those gains spiritually keep happening. What is of most importance to us is not our outward form of our actions. Allah doesn't care how you look, how you dressed up to come to Taraweeh. Doesn't care if your hijab matched your abaya. Doesn't care. It doesn't matter. All Allah cares about is the substance of the heart in the person that stood there before him. Allah Ta'ala says, although we perform all of our duties and conform to all of our protocols, it is sincerity that is the purpose and intention behind our actions. The Prophet Sallallahu said, actions are judged by their intentions and everyone will get what we intended. Can you imagine if every deed we did, we only intended reward in this life in the form of fame, in the form of praise, in the form of applause, and on the day of judgment we show up? Allah, the hadith says that Allah will tell us Go and get your reward from the one that you did it for. You're not going to get anything from me. Go and get your reward from the one that you did it for. Sincerity is so important. Remember that purpose and intention are like the soul of a body. Many seeds look alike, subhanAllah. Many seeds look alike, but as they begin to grow, their difference becomes shown. Not all seeds are the same. Not every person standing in the line of prayer is the same. Not every person sitting in the room learning is the same. The hearts make them different. The purer and higher the motive, the greater the value and yield of your efforts. He says, for all of your daily actions, ready, this is it, and we're done. Remind yourself of the motives behind what you're doing. Remind yourself why you're doing what you're doing. Why? Gratitude to Allah. Gratitude. And you know the beautiful part about gratitude? is that if you're doing this action because you want something more in this life, Allah promises you that if you are grateful, you will get more. You get a two for one. We're Muslims. We love a deal. He says, in shakartum, la nakum. If you are grateful, I will give you more. You don't have to change your intention to get more because if you're grateful, you'll get more. But if you do your intention just to get more, and it's not gratitude that's your intention, you lose out on the more and on your relationship with Allah. It's either a double or nothing. For all of your daily actions, remind yourself of the motives behind your deeds. This may be the best way to ensure the purity and exclusiveness of purpose and intention. Two things I'll leave you with, and then we'll end. Number one, make sure that you have some deeds that are between you and Allah that no one knows about, no friend or family. Do not share them. It could be something as small, and I'm using small here in quotes, because if it's private and if it's meaningful, it could be the thing that saves you in uh, on the Day of Judgment. It could be something as small in time and in weight as every time you are alone in the car and there's no one there, you make a istighfar. <laughs> that becomes what you're known for. And those private moments, the commutes, the drives that you take on the Day of Judgment will show up maybe bigger than anything you did in public. So number one is, have something that no one else knows about. Number two, it's not just about quantity, it's about quality. If there are things that you do in public and in private, like pray, give charity, etc., 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 you can't maybe change the quantity. That's already done. What you can do is you can make sure that your quality is so much better when it's solely for Allah's sake. When there's no reputation on the line, that your quality is higher. I have a friend who's a reciter, beautiful voice, beautiful voice. When he leads in the masjid, 
I thought it was a 10 out of 10. I was like, get this brother a deal, right? Send this guy to the Emirates. Let's hook him up. When I one time was in his house, and I told him that I was leaving, but on the way out, I stopped to use the bathroom. And then I was, it was one of those apartments that where the bathroom was right by the front door. And then I was leaving. I heard him reciting. And wallahi, it was probably 10 times better than anything I've ever heard him do in public. Later, I asked him about it. I said, hey, wh- who was that other guy in your apartment that was reciting? <laughs> I said, hey, your voice was so beautiful. I said, brother, why are you depriving us? Why are you holding back? He said, this is between me and Allah. I, he goes, I can do this, but I keep it just between me and Allah. Because I don't want everything I have to be with everybody. If you love somebody, you have to have some secrets. If you have a spouse that you love, you don't put everything online. You keep some secrets, right? You have to. It's a sign of your love. So quantity is one, but keep the deeds that are there in front of everybody, make sure those high quality ones are with Allah. The dua in public is good. Make dua in private and just open your heart to Allah. Let that flow. And the sincerity that is there, wallahi, I'm promising you not because I know anything, but because Allah promises us this, that you will feel it and it will change your life. We ask Allah Ta'ala to bless everybody here. We ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive, forgive us of our sins. We ask Allah Ta'ala to gift us the gift of sincerity. We ask you, O Allah, to make us more concerned with what you think about us than what anyone else thinks about us. O Allah, we ask you to bless us. O Allah, we ask you to purify our hearts and souls. O Allah, we ask you to keep us on the straight path. O Allah, we ask you that every moment that we are tested, that we we pass the test, Ya Rab. O Allah, we ask you that every test that we fail, that you forgive us, Ya Allah, for those moments. O Allah, we ask you to give us the strength to make the right decisions in tough times. O Allah, we ask you to grant us all purity in our relationships. We ask you to rectify our families and our friendships, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make us those people that when we enter Ramadan, we leave it forgiven of our sins. O oh Allah, do not let us become those people that take Ramadan lightly, Ya Allah. Don't let us be those people that Ramadan enters into our life and we leave it and we're not forgiven, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, allow us to keep these habits after the month has ended. O oh Allah, allow us to harvest the fruits of this month, Ya Allah. Allow us to taste the sweetness of these fruits and allow us to remember the fragrance and the sweetness long after this month has ended, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, there are so many people in here tonight, Ya Allah, that have difficulties in their hearts that they can't even say, Ya Allah, that they can't share with anybody and they may not even be able to say it out loud, Ya Allah, but you know what is in the hearts of every person. Oh Allah, I'm asking you, Ya Allah, because of your greatness and your generosity and your majesty, Allah, that you give relief and you give solution to every person that is struggling, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, you know of all the deep, dark difficulties that we struggle with, Ya Allah. You are the only one who knows all, Ya Allah, and we ask you, as the only one who can give us relief, that you solve and cure all of us from our difficulties, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and you give us the strength to transcend beyond them, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, make firmness our faith. Make firm our faith, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Make firm our love in you. Oh Allah, allow us to experience sincerity and to never let it go, and allow us to follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our actions, in our speech, in our everyday life. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Rahim, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanak, Allahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakum Allah khairan, everybody. Thank you so much for dealing with the, the, the situation, the heat, everything. We do have uh, uh, some pizza outside. Uh, so we ask that everybody, inshallah, uh, uh, dismisses in a, in a nice way. You can leave the chairs where they are, inshallah. You can leave the chairs where they are. And uh, inshallah, we will be uh, uh, meeting back here uh, for heart work on Monday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa